Hey, God bless you. Listen, thank you for joining us today for the Truth Encounter broadcast. Listen, there's a powerful word from the Lord today. I believe it's going to tremendously bless your life. I can't wait to hear the testimonies of what God is doing for you. Listen, uh, listen, follow us on Facebook. Go and tell us there. Send us a message. Let us know how these messages and these teachings are empowering and impacting your life for the glory of God. All right. I look forward to hearing from you. Come on, let's go into the word today. Bible says here in John 14 verse 15 he says in Amplified if you if you really love me you will keep in parentheses obey my commands one verse today if you really love me you will keep or you will obey my commands as I shared with you on last week we started there in First Samuel, the 15th chapter, and I dealt with how Saul was given or, or, or Samuel was given. The prophet Samuel was given a message to go and share with King Saul. He was going to go tell him, hey, I need you to go down and kill all of the Amalekites. Wipe them out. Every last one of them. I want them all dead because of their mistreatment of the children of Israel. Don't leave any of them alive. Saul went down to obey God but in the process his soldiers his men said hey it's some good stuff here some sheep it's some goat here there's some nice things here why don't we take those things for ourselves and then offer them as a sacrifice or an offering unto God well they decided to do that said they would do that God was displeased with it say you did not obey me and so as a result of their disobedience uh, God stripped King Saul of the kingdom Not only did he strip him of the kingdom, he also said, listen, because of your disobedience, he said, I'm going to give the kingdom to your neighbor who is better. Everybody say better. All right. I won't get away from this probably throughout the entirety of this series dealing with obedience because I want you to understand that word better means more pleasing. He said, listen, I'm taking the kingdom from you and I'm giving it to someone who is better. We often think that uh, in our walk with God, everybody is the same. But if you look in scripture, you will find that everybody's not the same. Everything is not the same. And although, although these things that we see may seem or appear small and insignificant, significant to us you got to understand that they are of great importance to God the simple act of obedience is of great importance to God the simple act of obedience makes a great deal of a matter before God okay even he said your sacrifice he said your obedience is better than your sacrifice it's more pleasing God said I would rather have you obey me than to bring men offerings I would rather have you obey me than to bring me your gifts. I would rather have you obey me, obey my commands than to try to give me the world. Okay, look at this right here. Your obedience to God will determine the level in which you please God. If you're writing, write that down. Remember that your obedience to God will determine the level in which you please God. See, you can't please God beyond your willingness to obey him. You can't please God beyond your willingness to submit to him. So at the level you submit to God is the level in which you will please God because you will always be doing what he wants of you or you will be doing what you want to do. Some of you, your life is is a, a you obey God when it's convenient. So as long as his command is convenient, you obey and you please him then. Then some of you, you obey sometimes. 50% I do, 50% I don't. Then there are those that obey God. uh, uh, They try to submit to God all the time. And God favors their lives. Then there are some that's just in full rebellion. They're not following God any time. But you have to make up in your mind. Okay, God, I'm going to do my best to obey you at all times. Because my obedience is pleasing in your sight. Here's the thing. You got to be willing to get over yourself. You got to be willing to get over what you want and the way you want it and how you think it should be. Let me tell you something. God does not care about how you think things should be. Really, Pastor, I thought he loved me. He does love you. And I'm going to deal with that word love in a minute and you'll see how God sees love. It has nothing to do with caring about what you want out of your life. What God cares about is you wanting what he wants for you out of your life. 
And that's the thing you got to begin to look at. Am I doing what God wants or am I doing what I want? Am I doing things my way or am I doing things God's way? I was talking to somebody the other day and I was telling him about my walk with God and how God had to deal with me in the area of obedience to him. As I was learning to follow and obey his voice, one of the things me and God had a problem with, God didn't have a problem, it was really just me, but I was being a problem for him. Here's the thing, y'all know I'll be transparent with you, Uh, because I think I'm a pretty intelligent guy, all right? I think think I'm pretty smart, okay? I don't know everything, but I like to know a little bit about, about something, right? And so here's me and God. God is trying to direct and orchestrate my life. And I'm like, God, that don't make sense. Now, did y'all catch what I just said? You see, how, see now that's stupid to, to me. Like, that's like pure stupidity. But that was a time in my life I was like, God, that don't make sense. And God was like, don't make sense to who? To you? I didn't ask you before I gave you the instructions. I didn't ask you before I commanded this of you. I didn't ask you to tell me whether or not you liked it. I just asked you to do it. And so me and God had that wrestling match because I was like, God, I hear you, but that don't make sense. So I'm questioning if this is really you. Because surely you wouldn't. The God of the universe that has all knowledge wouldn't tell me to do something like this. This can't be God. When I first learned to hear the voice of God, one of the things I struggled with is the way God spoke to me. God spoke to me in a way that did not make sense. And when I say it didn't make sense, it didn't make sense to me, to my understanding. I understood what he was saying, the words, but I did not understand uh, the way he phrased it. Like, I was like this. I was thinking, wow, God, okay, God, if that's you speaking to me, why don't you form it? See, I had this, this mind that God knew how to form perfect sentences. And when God would speak, he would, he would speak in perfect grammar. And so when God would speak to me, it would come sounding all crazy. And I'd be like, this can't be God. God, you wouldn't speak like that. This got to be my own mind. It's the devil trying to imitate God. Can't be. And what I had to learn as I went through a process with that, I learned that those things were God. And then I discovered that God talked to me that way because he was trying to show me, son, you don't know anything. And he said, my wisdom or or my foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of man. Let me help you all right here. Here's what he said. That's what the Bible said. The Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man, which means what sounds like foolishness to us (laughs) is still better than any idea we can come up with. Did you catch that? What sounds crazy to you and I is better than anything we could ever formulate. That's the kind of God that we serve. He had to teach me. He had to teach me that, son, what I know and what I'm showing you and what I'm telling you is greater, it is better than anything you can ever devise in your own mind, in your own thinking. So this is why your obedience becomes greater. It becomes better than anything you could come up with, anything you could ever think of, anything anything you can ever formulate. So your obedience determines your your level, the level in which you please God. Now, I'm the kind of person I ask a lot of questions and I want to know, God, why? Why is it you favor the obedient, but yet, God, you classify the disobedient as being a disloyal, rebellious, occultic, idol worshiping witch? Now, I told you all that if you missed last week, you got to go back and read First Samuel 15. This is what he called them. He called them disloyal, rebellious, occultic, idol worshiping witches when they operate in rebellion and disobedience to him. I was like, God, those are some strong words to call somebody just for disobedience. And so I began to navigate through that and I began to study that and see that thing. I was God, okay, help me understand. And hear me now, God created us all. And so God does not wrestle to get his creation to obey him. God doesn't force any of us. God has given us the ability to choose. To choose if we will follow him. Listen now, you cannot, you cannot follow your own mind in your own way. Whenever you follow your own mindset, your own way, you have to resist God in order to do so. And this is the development or an act of pride against God. Pride is not just dangerous, but pride is deadly. Do y'all hear me in here? The Bible informs us that God resists the proud. Do y'all see that? Go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5, 
verse verse five and six. I want to show you all something. First Peter five and six. All right. I want you to see this right here, that that God resists the proud. OK, first Peter five, first Peter, chapter five. Verse number five, put that up there for me. The Bible says, therefore, humble yourselves, that is, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. Go back to verse five. That's what I want. Verse five. Go back to verse five. That's the one I want to show you. All right. I want you all to see this. All right. He says, likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank, be subject to the elders, the ministers and spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. Clothe yourselves, all of you with humility as the garb of a servant so that its covering cannot be, be possible, uh, cannot possibly be. All right. All right. Stop right there. I want the I'm going to pull it myself. I want the King James. All right. I want to show you all this. Because it reads in the Amplified, it reads a little bit different. All right. First Peter five, verse five says, likewise, you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility for God resist the proud and gives grace to the humble. Y'all see that? He said he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Let me say it again because I want you to get this in your spirit. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Hear me now. Whenever you operate in pride, that is your own life, my way, the way I'm going to do things, the way I want to do it, my own thinking, my own opinion, my own agenda, my own mindset. You make God your enemy. All right. You make God your enemy. It positions you as an opponent of God. Instead of one who cooperates with God, you are forcefully wielding your decision, your power of decision, opinions and agenda over the will of God. And so God said, because you choose to do things your way, I will resist you. What does that mean? That means God will make the way of the proud hard. Some people are frustrated because they're trying to do things their way. They're frustrated because all they can think about is how they want to do it and what they want to do. And they're unwilling to submit to God. So things are hard. Things are difficult. They're trying to overcome but can't because the only way you're going to overcome is by listening to and submitting yourself to the voice of God. When you submit and surrender to the voice of God, God will make your way prosperous. Okay. We have the power to make our own decisions. But God wants you to submit that unto him. Hear me now. Obeying God is the only way to guarantee you will fulfill your purpose. I hope you write that down and remember that. Obeying God is the only way to guarantee you will fulfill your purpose in God. God doesn't force anybody to obey him. He wants us to surrender and submit to him. Why? Because when you surrender and you submit to God, it's more than just following instructions. It's more than just taking commands from God. There is something that goes on on the inside of you that has to do with your obedience. It has to do with the way you feel about it. It has to do with the way you think about what you're being told to do. And so that's why the Bible says man looks on the outward appearance but God looks at the heart God is not just looking at did you do it God is looking at what was the state of your heart when you did it or if you didn't do it what was the state of your heart the condition of your heart your thinking that kept you from doing what he called you to do notice this I'm back at John told y'all we rolling John 14 and 15 he says if you really love me then you will keep you will obey my commands. Notice what Jesus said talking to his disciples. He said, listen, I need you to understand something that if you really love me, if your heart is really for me, what you will do is you will obey my commands. You will obey me when you love me. Notice this love is an act of commitment. It is active commitment in your life. And, and, it, and, and one theologian put it this way. It is the act of, a, of, of directing your heart, your will, and your behaviors in the direction of God. Or if we break that down into an intended target.
okay? Real love is a commitment, all right? When you say you love somebody, you're saying I'm making a commitment to this person. What am I committing to? When you, when you gave, when you stood at an altar or wherever you got married and you, you said, I want to marry this person and you made vows with that person, your vows were not uh, just a commitment. That's what vows are. Vows are a commitment, but it wasn't a commitment to always feel warm and fuzzy about you. It wasn't a commitment to always have this euphoric feeling of love that's in my heart. It wasn't a commitment to even being happy all the time. But you made a commitment to that person. Are y'all still with me? Which means regardless of what we face or what storms we encounter or deal with, I am committed to you. I'm not going anywhere. When God talks about love, God is talking about a commitment. OK, it's a commitment in the direction I'm committed to my wife. That is on our good days. My heart is for her on my bad days. My heart is for her. She's the only woman I want. She's the only woman I desire. It's a commitment. I'm committed to loving her. I'm committed to serving her in our marriage. I'm committed to her. Do you hear what I'm saying? Here's the thing. Now catch this. I'm so committed to her. This is love now that my commitment to her is discriminative. What does that mean, pastor? That means she will always win even when somebody else think they are supposed to win. All right. Make that plain, pastor. Here, here is what love does. When you really love God, everybody in your life can be mad at you as long as you please God. See, when you really love God, everybody can talk bad about you as long as God speaks well of you. See, it's discriminative. Everything I do, I do for him, not for anybody else. That's the kind of love that God wants you to have. That is so committed to him that everything will lose, guess what, including yourself for his glory. See, that's what love is really about. Love is so dedicated that even to my own hurt, to my own anguish and pain, I'll still commit to you, God. I don't like it, but if you like it, that's what I'm doing, God. I don't even want to go there, but if that's where you want me, God, I'll go. See, that's the kind of love we're talking about. And people, people now hook up in relationships talking about, but I love him. I'm so in love with her. I want to see your commitment. Let me see you uh, a few months after you say I do. Let me see you a few years after you say I do. Are you still committed? Do you still have, because anybody's married to tell you, the, the butterflies that you get and all that, ooh, I just love you so much, that stuff is going to fade. I ain't saying it'll be gone forever. You can get it back. Me and my wife figured that out. When we feel like, hey, baby, I ain't feeling you. I ain't feeling you either. Come on, we need to. Hey, listen, friends, listen, I'm not done yet, but I just wanted to jump in real quickly and invite you to any one of our services at the Truth Church. We meet on Sunday mornings at 1030 a.m. where the power of God fills the house there and does an amazing work at the Truth Church. Listen, we're located at 2019 Ball Road right here in the beautiful city of Memphis, Tennessee. And I would love to see you there. I promise you, your life will never be the same. All right. Or you can join us on Wednesday night for our kingdom training and empowerment night every Wednesday night night at 7 p.m. God is doing an amazing work as we teach on the kingdom principles of God that will really transform your life. All right. Look, I look forward to seeing you at the True Church real soon. Come on. Let's go back into today's message. Hey, we need to go reconnect because it's so easy to get caught up in the routine. Come on. I'm going somewhere. You get up in the root. You get caught up in the routine of marriage, the routine of raising a family, and you'll forget to commit that love to one another. Oh, let me help somebody. Because if nobody ever, nobody ever told you, I'm going to tell you. Your children don't come first in your marriage. Do y'all hear me? Ooh, pastor, I can't believe that. That ain't right. 
They're my babies. No, 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 no. When you are married, your husband or your wife comes first, not your children. I was watching a movie last night, and the movie, and they, and they were saying, and the man was like, uh, yeah, he was coming into a, it was going to be a blended family and he was telling the lady uh, that he was going to marry his fiance. He said, I want you to be committed to your children because I want them to be first in your life the way it should be. I wanted to turn the TV off. I said, no, sir. She needs to be committed to you and you committed to her. And when y'all committed to one another, you can serve the children better. What good is it if my commitment is to, is to always be there for my children, but I'm never there for my spouse? Don't you know the tension that is created in that kind of dynamic is going to affect the children? So your first commitment, somebody watching me on TV going to turn the TV off. Your first commitment is to your spouse, not your children. And if you're not married and you have children, it's to your children then. Not to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You don't put gas in your boyfriend or your girlfriend car and your children need shoes. Let me get off that. <sighs> Where was I? <laughs> we were talking about love. You go to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, many people refer to this as the love chapter in the Bible. The love scriptures there. Love is patient. Love is kind. Okay. Y'all have heard that before. If you go read it. But I want you to read it in the context of commitment. And you will find that it's not just love will show up in these ways. But think about it like this. Love means I'm committed to doing the things found in that chapter. Read it that way, because you will find you can have all these feelings of love and you won't feel like this stuff. You can be you can say you in love and still be selfish. You can say you in love. I counsel many of husbands that, that when I counseled them, we discovered one of the biggest problems they had is that they were selfish. But they love their wives, but they didn't know how to commit, how to commit to being giving. And compassionate towards them. It's a commitment that you make. Okay? Just like when I open the door for my wife to get in the car. That's a commitment. All right? To, to making her feel special. Sometimes I don't feel like walking on her side and opening the door. Sometimes she just says something to me I don't like. In my mind, like, open the door yourself. <laughs> but it's a commitment. Okay? It's a commitment to doing, to doing those things. When you are committed to something. All right. Everything else will lose. And I use the term lose because that's the term I think of. Everything else will lose. Everything else in your life loses for God, even yourself. Essentially, love for God is committed to doing anything and everything that pleases him, even if it doesn't please anyone else, including yourself. Do you all hear me? Okay, so God says, as I go back to 1 Samuel, he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. He rejects Saul, says, I'm going to give the kingdom to one who is better than you. Hear me now. You can do all kinds of God things without, God, without a God kind of love. You can do all kind of stuff that looks like love, but it's not really love. Here's the difference now. Let me share this with you. What happened? Why was David better than Saul? David was better than Saul in this term of the word better because he loved God. David loved God more than Saul did. We can take that out of scripture when we look at that. The Bible doesn't say it that way, but when we see it, where David is more pleasing to God. Why was he more pleasing? Because he was willing to obey God. Well, what is my obedience? Why do I obey God? I obey because I love him. Here's the thing I'm challenging you on today. If you really obey God, where's your love for him? How much do you obey God? Your obedience to God is a willful act of love. God doesn't make you love him. There is nothing of your material things. That's why obedience is better than sacrifice. There is nothing material that you can give God that will be an exchange or substitute for love. There is nothing you have. Let me just say it this way. As a matter of fact, there is nothing you have or possess that God even wants from you. There is nothing material you can give God that will meet any need God has. 
God is not a pimp trying to get something from you. God is a father that's after a relationship with you. And so his obedience is about loving. His obedience is about you caring, you being truly committed to him. Giving, when we give, it's done out of our love for God, not out of just instructions that are, or instructions that we don't understand or religious rituals. If you don't really love God, how can he take pleasure in your gifts? If you don't really love God, how can he take pleasure in the things you bring to him? If you're not willing to obey him, what God wants from you is relationship, not things. You can't buy God's love. It's got to really be in your heart. The beauty of obedience is that it's done out of a willing heart for God. Obedience is better than sacrifice because it comes from a heart of love. Okay, here's the thing I love about David. David was 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 uh, uh, a man. The Bible says after God's own heart. But David was not a perfect man. Mm, this is good right here. All right. As I come to my end, I want you to see this. David was a man after God's own heart, but he was not perfect. David is commonly known for being the man, the king of Israel, that slept with another man's wife. And then, not only did he commit adultery, he then turned around and murdered the man. So he was an adulterer and a murderer. Do y'all hear me? But yet God still... Hey friends, saw. listen, we're out of time today, but listen, I know... You've been tremendously blessed by the word of the Lord on today. I believe something was said in this message that has really encouraged you and really impacted your life for the better. God has great things in store for you, great things that he wants to do and perform in your life. And I believe this is your day, this is your time, and this is the hour that God is really going to prove himself to you. Listen, before we go, I want to invite you to come fellowship with us right here at the Truth Church. We're located at 2019 Ball Road, right here in the beautiful city of Memphis, Tennessee. Listen, come from near, come from far, wherever you are, we would love to have you worship with us. I believe your life will never be the same. We pray that if you walk through the doors one time, that your life will experience a transformation and a shift that you'll never be the same ever again in your life. So look, I want to see you at the Truth Church uh, this Sunday. Meet us this Sunday, 10.30 a.m., and watch what God will do in your life, all right? Listen, I thank God for you. We'll be praying for you. I can't wait to see you again on The Truth Encounter. Be blessed.